Snow and Mike and Debbie are next with News 8 at 6. Have yourself a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow. This is Wish TV's 24-Hour News 8, the recognized leader in 24-hour news coverage. Coming up next on News 8 at 6 o'clock, Debbie and I will have these stories for you. A man accused of murdering his parents has his first day in court today. I'm Laura Jones. I'll have that story coming up on News 8. Also tonight, a tragedy compounded in Florida. A plane flying emergency supplies to storm victims crashes into a house near Miami. In Newcastle, some angry people marched on City Hall today just five days before they are due to lose their homes. We'll show you what happened. And there's a flash flood watch in effect this evening, but good news, the rains are subsiding. I'll have the forecast. Plus, do we tend to ignore our viewers sometimes? That's apparently the gist of one of the letters to Mike's mailbag this week. Those stories and more coming next on News 8 at 6 o'clock as your 24-hour news service continues. You're watching Central Indiana's only 24-hour news service on Indiana's own Wish TV, Channel 8. Now, Mike Ahern, Debbie Knox, meteorologist Cliff Nicholson, and sports with Mark Patrick. 24-hour News 8 continues now. 19-year-old right Stephen Holmes makes a short journey today from the Marion County Jail to his arraignment. Police say he murdered his parents in cold blood while his little sister watched. Good evening at 6 o'clock now, and the man who has confessed to killing his parents arrived at criminal court today. It was Stephen Holmes' first appearance since the death of his parents on Tuesday night. News 8's Laura Jones is in the newsroom, and she tells us about an interesting new development. Laura? Well, Debbie and Mike, Holmes was moved this morning from the Marion County lockup to an observation cell at the Marion County Jail. Officials say he threatened to commit suicide, but that didn't threaten his arraignment this afternoon. 19-year-old Stephen Holmes had his first day in court today. Holmes is accused of murdering his parents Tuesday night after an argument over money. Police say Holmes confessed to killing his parents, Michael and Linda, with a semi-automatic rifle while his 9-year-old sister watched. His 3-year-old brother was asleep upstairs. Neither child was injured. He allegedly planned the shootings back in April when he bought the gun along with several hundred rounds of ammunition. Police say he showed them a sheet of notebook paper with his detailed plans. Holmes has been charged with two counts of murder, and he's being held in the Marion County Jail without bond. The prosecutor's office is considering seeking the death penalty. It'll be reviewed sometime, I would guess, within the next couple of months, and a decision will be made based upon other circumstances that definitely fits within the the qualifications under the law. Friends and neighbors say the Holmes adopted Michael when he was four years old. They say he suffered abuse before the adoption. Friends also say that while Michael and his parents had not been getting along, the Holmes loved their son. And everyone is in shock over the shootings. Now, an interesting note, police say Holmes also planned to rob and kill two people at a drugstore at 49th in Pennsylvania that same evening his parents were killed. In a statement to police, he said he didn't carry out his plan because two police officers were sitting in the drugstore parking lot. Now, funeral services for Michael and Linda Holmes will be held Saturday at St. Thomas Aquinas Catholic Church. Mike and Debbie? Laura, thank you. Laura Jones in our newsroom. Well, time is running out for 69 Newcastle families living without utilities. On September 1st, the city there intends to condemn their buildings. And in this latest chapter of the story News 8 has been following, the soon-to-be homeless tenants have gone marching on City Hall, begging for a reprieve. Leslie Olson was there. I told stay on you the what sidewalks and stay peaceful. Newcastle apartment dwellers prepare to protest city government. Wanna go? Save our homes! We don't wanna go! It's been more than a week since the gas and water has been turned off at the Rose Court Apartments and several other individual properties owned by Ohio-based landlord Bruce Pickering. According to the local apartment manager, most tenants are up to date on rent, which is supposed to include utilities. However, the landlord has not paid the utility companies for months. Pickering tells News 8 by phone he is delinquent because tenants from other projects owe money. These tenants say they are being unfairly punished. They are calling for Mayor Sherman Bowles to delay a September 1st condemnation. Ask the questions first, and I'll be glad to answer them. Is there any help you can give us? Nothing. I don't know a thing that we can do. Every service organization in this community, we've, we've, we've extended credit to Rose Court several times. We are in, he's in debt to us $22,000. We cannot continue to keep paying Bruce Pickering's utility bills. 
The mayor promises legal action against Pickering to recover debts for the city, but not the tenants. But stay as long as you want to today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Although the city offers no advice, several local agencies continue to meet to try to develop a contingency plan for the soon-to-be homeless. But the news is disheartening. Units with several bedrooms are hard to come by anyway in this community. And uh, because these families have now saturated the housing market, there are no units available out there to even rent. For now, the tenants are told the best they can hope for is to stay in a homeless shelter indefinitely. Leslie Olson, Wish TV, News 8. The community agencies in Newcastle will search for permanent housing for the tenants, and a legal services attorney is reviewing the case to see if legal action against the landlord should be filed. Florida emergency workers suffered a deadly setback trying to help victims of Hurricane Andrew. Two people died when a plane carrying food and diapers went down near Miami today. A state official says the pilot reported engine trouble and was trying to turn back when the Cessna crashed into a home. And in other areas, workers and residents are complaining of problems getting food, water, and other supplies to storm victims. State officials say they can't get supplies to some of the hardest hit areas because of blocked roads and a lack of organization. This late developed now, presiding, or I should say President Bush has now promised to send federal troops to Florida to help with damage and destruction down there. Well, amid flooding and fallen trees, Louisiana residents are slowly uncovering the damage from Hurricane Andrew. The storm left a path of toppled trees and destroyed homes. The mayor of Morgan City says he thinks every house and every business in the town has been damaged. State officials say the damage is not even, or could have been worse, because Andrew went ashore west of New Orleans over mostly a rural area. A helping Hoosier hand will be extended to the victims of Hurricane Andrew. Operation Dixie Relief is now underway. Organized by the Indiana National Guard, supplies are being collected at all Guard armories, as well as at volunteer fire departments and grocery stores. With 200,000 people homeless from the hurricane, the need for help is great. I, I think there's a definite need, and, and I think uh, Hoosiers are going to pitch in, and I think we're going to be able to uh, really help some people out down there. Fifty National Guard trucks will be loaded up and sent south. Supplies needed include bottled water and canned goods, but even items like toothpaste and pet food are welcome. Donations will be accepted through Tuesday. Well, letters about the weather, the disease, AIDS, and more pile into Mike's mailbag this week. Your comments are coming up on our 24-hour news service. And in sports this evening, quarterback Jack Trudeau and the Colts have scored a new contract. Mark Patrick has details for us. A big update today on future plans for Fort Benjamin Harrison. I'm Tina Cosby, and I'll have details coming up. Well, people living around Fort Benjamin Harrison learned a little more today about the future of that base. The fort is scheduled to close by 1995. This morning, the Army held a briefing about the planned reuse of the land. And as News 8's Tina Cosby tells us, so far, reaction to some of the proposed ideas is not good. It was by no means the final word on how the land of Fort Benjamin Harrison will be parceled off after the base is closed, but it was a rough outline. Basically, federal agencies and agencies helping the homeless will get priority. $25 million in annual revenue and more than 4,600 jobs will be lost when the fort closes. No one wants to be left out of possibly salvaging the leftovers. The finance center jobs and the fort we use really need to come together because that affects the whole community. Another big concern, the possible closure of the commissary and PX. But there are a lot of veterans out there who paid the price for those benefits. And now, by the fact that they're not going to be available to them, they might be able to go to Fort Knox, Kentucky. Now, that's a long place, a long way, a long way to drive to get a loaf of bread. Still yet another sticking point, the timeline outlined here today for Hoosiers to act. A, a timeline such as this should not be forced upon us unless the Army and the Department of Defense would like to make a decision on the Finance Center a little bit sooner. Regardless of the closures here on the base, the Army says the 123rd Army Reserve Command stays and will be central to the area known as the Reserve Enclave. But that's one of the only certainties at this point, other than the base will close. The next order of business for the task force, what to do with the former Army Finance Center. Those discussions get underway in early 1993. At Fort Benjamin Harrison, Tina Cosby, Wish TV, News 8. The commission adds that some sort of medical facility will remain on the base as long as soldiers are stationed there. Well, opponents of paramutual racing in Shelby County filed court documents today trying to reverse a zoning decision. The group SCOPE, Shelby Coalition Opposing Paramutual Enterprises, says certain procedures weren't followed by the zoning board when it decided to rezone a parcel of land near Fairland last month. 
we are challenging the procedures that were followed by the board in calling the meeting, in holding the meeting, and the decision that they rendered. We're claiming all these were illegal acts under the statute. A Shelby County judge is expected to decide within 30 days if the zoning board should submit meeting transcripts to the court. Two other sites, both in Madison County, are under consideration for the first horse racing facility in Indiana. Well, in just about an hour, the Indianapolis School Board is expected to pass a budget for 1993 that includes a property tax increase of 4.4 percent. That means if your home is assessed at about $30,000, you'll pay an additional $69 a year. Lack of a teacher contract is also likely to be discussed this evening. Indianapolis teachers have been working without one now for more than a year. There are 21 unresolved issues ranging from class size to teacher salaries. Indiana Bell customers in central Indiana soon will be able to find out who is calling them before they answer the phone. Indiana Bell introduced caller ID today. President Tom Ryman previewed plans to put this service in effect as early as next week. Caller ID allows customers to see the number of the person calling before picking up the phone. Indiana Bell predicts caller ID will reach as many as 10,000 customers in central Indiana in its first year. Our forecast coming up, weekend maybe in sight. Oh, you bet it is. I'm already thinking about it. Yeah, I can tell you are. And I have a weekend forecast for you. Stay tuned. has been approved by the American Meteorological Society. So we had a little taste of Andrew here in central Indiana, mm -hmm. at least rain-wise, not winds, thank Just goodness. Just a little taste. Mm -hmm. You're saying that Bob gave us a real dose about uh, 13 years ago? 79. Yeah. Right, good memory. Oh. <laughs> Quick <Hurricane. math. laughs> now, Hurricane Bob brought anywhere from 4 to 8 inches of rain to central Indiana in 79. The heaviest rainfall I've seen, which is just an isolated amount down in Brownstown, 5 and a half inches of rain, because oh. within the rains that have come up, most of it's been relatively oh, moderate to fairly heavy, but that was kind of a real heavy isolated downpour. Five there. and a half inches, that's a lot of rain that's, in a short time. Uh, you bet. Consequently, flash flood watch, I'll show you that. High temperature this afternoon in Indianapolis was 75 degrees after a low this morning of 67. Out at the airport, 61 hundredths of an inch of rain for the month. We're now up to 1.30, still making it a fairly dry August, as you can see what the average should be there. With light rain outside at temperature 70, the dew point 68, and the relative humidity 95%. Winds out of the east at 5 miles per hour, and the barometer still going down 29.87. It's an indication that that cold front to the west of us really hasn't gone by right yet. During the past 24 hours, we can see Andrew down here, only a tropical depression, but it's still bringing lots of rain, 5 to 10 inches of rain to states in the Gulf Coast there. But look, now watch, that cold front in our region is pulling up some of that moisture. Over 12 hours, watch on the radar here, you can see old Andrew right down in here, still spinning around counterclockwise. Then here comes the heavier thunderstorms that we experienced this morning and, and this afternoon, this early evening hours, we're still picking up some light rain in the region. Some of the rainfall amounts, as I uh, mentioned, you folks in Brownstown, that's pretty good from our weather watchers calling in. Greensburg, about 1.8 inches of rain, a little over 2 inches in economy. Ellettsville, 2.6. Bedford, 2.8. Got some more for you, too. Anderson, you folks, about uh, one and a half inches of rain. Down in Franklin, about 2.4. And here in Marion County, the airport that is, as I just showed you, 61 hundredths. And, oh, I guess uh, John Mills, north central, about uh, 1.7 inches. Consequently, the flash flood watch, in effect, stretching from north of Fort Wayne to 35 miles south of Lafayette, Indiana. Current temperatures range mostly in the 60s and 70s. Up north in Chicago there, it's 59 degrees. In Detroit, Michigan, currently 63. Weather set up all this moisture in the region. The one-time hurricane is now a low-pressure system. By tomorrow afternoon, this dry air to the west is going to be feeding in over Indiana. We'll be drying out and clearing up tomorrow. Most of the precipitation will remain along the Atlantic uh, coastal states where they could see anywhere from about, oh, three to as much as five inches of rain in some areas to the east uh, over the weekend. High temperatures tomorrow will range even some cool 60s in the northern section of the state, 70s elsewhere. And then for Saturday, some of these 80s beginning to creep back up into the region. Here's the forecast tonight in Indianapolis. Periods of light rain, low temperature of around 63 degrees. Tonight, going into Friday, morning showers, a possibility, decreasing clouds otherwise, high temperature comparable to today, 75. Tomorrow night, clearing, cool, low temperature 54. The average low is 61 this time of the year, and on Saturday, Great way to start the weekend. Sunny and super high of 77 degrees. 
And on Sunday, another sunny day, high in the upper 70s. And at this point, just a chance of some showers, possibly Monday and Tuesday. But at, as of right now, it looks like just a great weekend. Terrific. Thank you, sir. Okay. Mark Patrick Sports coming up last night, 11 o'clock. You told us you thought Jack Trudeau would have a contract today. And by gosh, Voila. he does. Isn't that amazing, amazing. how these yeah. things work? Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps we had some inside information. Oh, would you think so? A source? Oh. A sports source. Back Only back. here on News 8, we're going to give you all the details of that contract we told you about first last night. Coming up next in Spoke. Appropriate. Now with sports. What do you think? We got, we got the quarterback. Is he inside. happy? Will he play Saturday? Yeah, play we Saturday? All you know, Debbie, that's right. what matters. Is he happy? Well, if he's happy, he'll play well. This would make me happy. This contract would make me happy. It would make me happy, too. Yeah. I think divided among the three of us, it would make us <laughs> very right. happy. That's right. Who's the newest Hoosier millionaire? Quarterback Jack Trudeau of the Colts, who put aside his differences with owner Robert Ursay long enough to put his autograph on a three-year deal that will pay him between $1.2 and $1.5 million a season with incentives. The Nick Ray is in our news lounge, and he caught up with Jackson before he left with the team for Kansas City today. Richard, uh, Jack's afraid of heights, so sitting on his wallet could be trouble now. Well, he's got plenty of money to fool with for the next couple of years, and unlike his rookie season when he missed two to three weeks of training camp, Jack Trudeau knows what he has to do mentally to get prepared for the NFL now that the toughest mind game is over. For Jack Trudeau, sitting in on stalled contract talks is a lot like, well, you get the picture. You know, last night was an experience that uh, nobody should have to go through, but, uh, you know, I think it was important that I was there and, I was in, and involved in it. Now, Trudeau is looking forward to getting involved in a real game of catch. Guys uh, that, that aren't quarterbacks aren't in, you can never find a receiver that'll, that'll run a route for you. They'll stand there and hold a beer in their hand and, and they'll catch it that way, but, but that's about all they'll do for you. And, uh, uh, you know, so I've been playing catch, but uh, other than that, there's really not been a lot and working out. Trudeau's signing really doesn't change Ted March Marchabrota's game plan for the season opener with Cleveland. He still plans to go with Mark Herman, but in the meantime, Trudeau plans to get in as much work as possible. And while Coach Marchabrota is glad to have Jack sign, there seems to be a slight difference of opinion if nine days is enough time for him to help this team. By the Cleveland game, we'll have a pretty good idea where I'm at as far as being on the field every day. And, you know, I don't, I'm not going to say right now that I'll be ready to go, but in my own mind, I think I will. I'm, 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 I'm pretty sure I can get it done. And, and like I said, the main thing is just get enough throws without getting my arms sore and uh, get ready to play. My thought at this time is that there's just too much involved. Uh, he's going to be, what, six, seven weeks behind everybody else on the field, and this is the National Football League, and it's awfully tough to, to win under those circumstances. And I, I'm not sure it's even be, be fair to Jack to put him into that, that, that kind of a situation. Now, the Colts expect to receive a roster exemption for Trudeau as he works up to speed, and the coach says he probably will wait until the last minute next weekend in deciding whether he'll activate Trudeau for the Browns game. As for tomorrow, Mark, I wouldn't look forward to seeing Trudeau taking any snaps against the Chiefs. Hey, interesting you mentioned that about uh, the roster exemption, Dick, because it looks like uh, Ron Stark is once again the emergency quarterback. So I think they'll probably get Jack ready for that Cleveland game, at least in that situation. Don't want to go into it with just two guys, and I think it'd be safe to have Jack ready to go. All right, thanks very much. The Dick Ray in our news lounge. The Colts' final workout before tomorrow night's test with the Tomahawks took place this morning at the complex. Mark Herman will take the first snap tomorrow night for the already injury-riddled Colts. Now, Ted Marchabrota knows that his team could be at full strength, but they're not for the uh, we're, final we're game. We're still in the training camp. We're, we're still refining everything that we, that, uh, that we have put in. I, I think the big thing is this is our best test of the year. This is the best football team that we've faced in, uh, in exhibition season, and uh, we want to see exactly what we can do against the, t against the playoff team. Indians game at Bush tonight rained out against Nashville, so the Tribe goes into tomorrow's home contest two and a half behind their opponents, the evil Buffalo Bisons, who are at a pivotal three-game series this weekend at Bush Stadium. Front-running Toronto Blue Jays have been looking for another starter for about three months. They were going to unload Todd Stottlemyre until he threw a one-hitter last night against the White Sox. Today, the Blue Feathers acquired National League All-Star pitcher David Cohn from the Mets oh, for infielder Jeff Kent. He's one of your favorite players, isn't he, Debbie? Yeah, sure. And a player to be named later. Cohn will be a free agent at the end of the year. He's been seeking a five-year contract from the Metropolitan, so big move for Toronto. Yeah, all right. And the Colts play tomorrow night, the last play, Yeah, it's tomorrow night against Kansas City. Kansas City. 
Yeah, he should be ready for Cleveland, don't you think? And Trudeau, he's, this is a new system Marsha Brod is bringing in, but the guys... We're going to bring him in here and work with him a little bit. <laughs> and, uh, in our field, our, yeah, our right home stadium, right, right out here. in the lot. Yeah, okay. All right, thanks, thank you, Mark. Mark. Well, coming up tonight at 11 o'clock on News 8, Central Indiana residents are responding to the urgent needs of hurricane victims in Florida and Louisiana. We'll have the latest on a massive relief effort underway and, again, show how you can help out. And some Indianapolis residents face the prospect of paying higher property taxes. A decision on whether to raise taxes will be made this evening, and we'll have details at 11 on News 8. Finally, after a week off for the Republican National Convention, the mailbag is reopened tonight. So let's get to a few of your letters. Our first letter concerns a recent News 8 story about the Catholic Church withdrawing its funding for the Damien Center because the center had distributed condoms. John Stebby of Indianapolis writes, I was disturbed by your editorializing when you should have been reporting. You said, one side wants to support the beliefs of the church, the other side wants to fight the spread of AIDS. From your statement, the obvious conclusion is that Catholics don't want to fight the AIDS virus. Did the Catholics say as much? Is it possible the church is just as concerned about AIDS as a Damien Center, but sees condom distribution as the wrong answer because it would give the users a false sense of safety, thus encouraging even more sexual activity? Surely it's irresponsible for a reporter to imply that the church is less concerned about AIDS than its own position on birth control. Mary Smith of Gas City has a different complaint. I get the feeling I'm eavesdropping on a private conversation when your reporters are on assignment. They usually say, Mike and Debbie, and continue their reports, just like you two are the only ones listening and watching. Well, Mary, you're right. That can be a problem from time to time, and to be honest with you, we anchors are occasionally guilty of that as well. Our intention is to make the newscast's presentation as conversational as possible, so we do news first names whenever we can, but that can become tiresome if we appear to exclude or ignore you, the viewer. So we'll watch that in the future, and thank you for bringing that to our attention. Finally, Valerie Real of Indianapolis writes, I'm a 12-year-old girl wondering how Cliff Nicholson gets the letters CNG for Cincinnati on his weather map. <laughs> That's because Cliff can't spell. He can't spell. Can't spell. No, there is a reason for this, right? <laughs> the National Weather Service assigns a three-digit identifier to every city in the United States. An example, Terre Haute, and they, a lot of times don't make any sense. Terre Haute, three-digit identifier is H-U-F or Huff. Chama, New Mexico, E-33. <laughs> the reason for that. So there's no reason there's for no it. No rhyme or reason. But they know the reason. Is, <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right, very good. Thank you, Cliff. And that's the mailbag for this week. Here's our address now. Let's hear from you. Mike's mailbag here of Wish TV, Post Office Box 7088, Indianapolis 46207. Remember, try to keep your letters and cards as brief as possible, and we'll go through the mailbag again next Thursday at the same time. Thanks for all the letters. That's our news for now. I'm Debbie Knox. I'm Mike Ahern. CBS Evening News is next. Good night.